I'm happy to introduce uh, Jason Hong, who's an assistant professor in the HCI Institute of the School of Computer Science at CMU. Um, Jason uh, did his undergraduate degrees at Georgia Tech, working with uh, uh, Gregory About, who lots of us know here. Um, he went on from there to Berkeley, did a PhD. Along the way, uh, co-authored a book uh, that sold 35,000 copies, you tell me. I should know this, since I'm a co-author, uh, on web design. Um, at CMU, he's continued on some of his work in privacy. He does usable privacy, also location-aware computing and um, ubiquitous computing. And today, he's going to talk about where a lot of that usable privacy work has been going the last few years, as well as how it's led to a, a startup company, Wombat Technologies, in this space. Jason. All right. Thank you, James. So uh, once again, my name is Jason Hong. And uh, today, I'm going to be talking about the work that my colleagues have been doing in usable privacy and security and specifically a deep dive into our one line of work, which is protecting people from these online phishing scams. So uh, before doing this deep dive into phishing scams, I thought it'd be useful to describe to you what usable privacy and security is. And uh, the basic observation behind usable privacy and security is that we're facing an increasing number of security problems that don't deal with traditional areas of security. They don't deal with uh, network protocols. They don't deal with encryption uh, algorithms. They don't deal with system implementations. But what they do deal with is people and the systems that they interact with. And uh, there's a lot of interesting problems here that are causing a lot of uh, issues and have caused a lot of security breaches in recent years. So let me give you a more concrete example of usable privacy and security. This is one that we've all faced. Do you want to install the software or not? Now, you don't have to necessarily have this specific interface. This is a question we always deal with. Do you want to uh, install this Flash, run this Flash application? Do you want to run this Java applet and so on? And the problem here is that the consequences of a bad decision or a wrong decision can be quite dramatic. Because in this specific case, you can imagine it leading it to malware, like uh, you can have lead to spyware or viruses or key loggers on your system if you make a bad decision here. Here's another example of an everyday security problem that we've all faced too, which is security uh, permissions or file permissions. And uh, you can imagine that this is actually quite a difficult task. There's actually a PhD student who graduated recently from Carnegie Mellon who was looking at this. And we've actually seen real world incidents where this has led to problems. So here in 2003, it turns out that there was a Senate Judiciary staffer that found that files were readable to all users rather than just to Democrats or to Republicans. And so what this entrepreneurial staffer did is he actually started stealing files from the other party and started using those things and started leaking it to the press. So you can imagine that this was quite embarrassing. Uh, here's yet another one that uh, we've all been seeing, too. There's been an uptick in a lot of these lost laptops that lead to stolen data or that lead to uh, sensitive data being lost. So Boeing worker fired over a lost laptop. New lost laptop scandal exposes company directors. HP pensions data on lost laptop. Theft of NHS laptop is a cause for concern. British Council staff data lost. All right, so this is just a quick Google search, and you can already find dozens of these kinds of incidents happening. So the main argument here is that the costs of unusable pricing and security are very, very high. So again, it can lead to people inadvertently installing spyware or other kinds of malware on their own systems. So here, it's not the system directly that's being attacked, but it's the operator of the system that's being attacked and being fooled into installing software that actually harms them in the long term. We all have too many passwords, too. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing thing that all our offices don't look like this, filled with post-it notes that all have our passwords on them. Or the alternative strategy, of course, is we only have one or two or three passwords, which is just as bad for security, because if you lose one of them, then all of those passwords, that, uh, all the systems that use that same password are also compromised. We also have people not updating software with the latest patches, which can also be a security vulnerability. We have firewalls and Wi-Fi boxes that are easily misconfigured. And this is how I actually got started in this area, which is looking at why don't people adopt a lot of these location-aware services? Because there's a lot of benefit there, but it turns out there were a lot of privacy concerns. And so, because people did not feel that they were in control of the systems, 
because people did not understand the systems, they did not adopt the systems. So I came at this from a very pragmatic standpoint, but then I discovered there's a much wider area of work that can be applied here. So uh, this area of usable price and security has been uh, identified as a grand challenge by two different groups. The first one is by the Computer Research Association. In 2003, they issued a grand challenge. Give end users security controls they can understand and privacy they can control for the dynamic, pervasive computing environments of the future. Now, similarly, the National Academy of Engineering also issued this challenge uh, in their grand challenges for engineering that more research needed, was needed on understanding the psychology of users as well as how cultural and social influences can affect how people use computers and electronic information in ways that increase the risk of cybersecurity breaches. Okay, so everyone has realized that this is a huge problem, not just for everyday computing, but also in terms of national security, corporate security, and so on. So this is actually uh, a lot of interesting aspects here, a lot of interesting challenges that we're trying to face here. So now I'm going to do a deep dive into uh, the specific line of work, and the, re the rest of the talk will be, which is uh, our work on anti-phishing. So to give you a better idea of this, let me tell you what phishing is. So I'm sure everyone in this room has probably received an email that's like this. So this is a, an eBay email. It says, Dear eBay member, we regret to inform you that your eBay account could be suspended if you don't re-update re -update your account information. To resolve this problem, please click on this link. Now, if you complied with this email and clicked on the link, you would be taken to a website that looks like this. And if you continue to comply with this email, you would probably enter in your username and password. Okay? Now, I'm sure almost everybody in this room has realized that this is actually a fake email, but this is the entire process of phishing, where, again, people are trying to fool users into giving them sensitive information. Now, phishing is a huge plague on the Internet. Now, I, I want to say that it's very hard to find specific numbers on how much damage it's causing, but here are some estimates. It's estimated to be around $350 million to $3 billion of direct losses every year. So the 350 million is clearly a lower bound. The 3 billion is, I would say, a higher bound. But the number, true number is probably somewhere in between. But this is direct money that's being stolen out of people's bank accounts. Now, an important uh, thing to also note here is that this does not include damage to one's reputation or loss of potential sales. Okay, so this is only, again, direct money that's being stolen out of your bank accounts. This also does not include the company's response costs, too. So, for example, we've been talking to some banks about the cost of phishing, and it turns out that it can cost several million dollars every single time the phishing email goes out because they have to man their call centers, they have to answer all these questions, and they also have their own recovery costs to try to find the money that was stolen out of people's bank accounts. Okay? And the other interesting thing, too, is that this phenomenon barely existed several years ago. So when we first started this project in 2004, this was only a small phenomenon, and at this time, it's actually grown to several billion dollars. So I think that the, we can say the derivative of this problem is growing quite fast. The other interesting aspect about the phishing attacks is that there's new kinds of phishing attacks. Uh, these are called spear phishing and whaling. Spear phishing is if I target you specifically, given that I know a lot of information about you. And whaling just means that you're attacking a really large target. So someone who is a CEO of a company or someone who is, uh, for example, a military general. And in fact, this has actually been used to steal sensitive uh, information both from corporations and the military. So this next screenshot is actually from Business Week. There was a recent uh, magazine article talking about these scams. And this is one that almost uh, fooled several people. And this is basically a request for proposal and has all the military jargon inside of it, has all the lingo, and it's basically asking people to open up the Microsoft Word file that has the request for proposals. And this would actually have infected a person's computer. Okay. So the, well, I want to emphasize that the criminals who do this are very, very smart. They're just as smart as anybody here. But uh, the advantage is, is that they have a lot more money than we do, and they also have, don't have to deal with the IRB issues, too. Uh, phishing is also becoming very, very pervasive, too. So the, a lot of universities are being attacked. CMU has recently seen a spate of phishing attacks recently, targeting a lot of the students. Uh, we've seen a lot of online social networking sites who are actually becoming major targets of this problem, too. And you may be wondering, why would they care about social networking sites? Well, it turns out that they might hack into your account and start spamming your friends, but it also leads to the other problem, too, which I mentioned earlier, which is a lot of people reuse their passwords. So if I can break into your social networking site by using a lot of these techniques, for example, hey, so-and-so wants to add you as a friend, you're likely to click on the link and then add, uh, and then try to log in. Well, then, once I know that, then I can find out what your passwords are, I might log into your email account, and then find out what bank accounts you have, and so on. Okay? 
Uh, it turns out social media sites too, like Twitter and World of Warcraft are also victims of this. So here's a screenshot of a recent victim. This is actually a CNN news reporter whose Twitter account was hacked and you can see that the person who hacked his account put up sort of an egregious message. And even World of Warcraft is being attacked. It's the most popular online game today, 11 million subscribers. Why would they care about this? They hack into your account, they steal your virtual gold, and they find out ways of selling it to turn it into real dollars. Okay, so again, the criminals are very, very clever. And uh, if this wasn't obvious too, it's highly illegal. So despite the fact that I know graduate students are not paid very well, you know, please remember to use your powers only for good, okay? Okay, so what can we do about this? So this is where our research comes into play. So our, the name of our project is Supporting Trust Decisions, and our goal is to help people make better online trust decisions. So should you install the software and so on. And we're doing this in the context of phishing attacks. We have a very large multidisciplinary team. We have experts in economics, public policy, uh, and privacy, computer security, social decision sciences, this good looking person over here is me, an expert in human computer interaction, and we also have experts in uh, e-commerce and uh, machine learning too. And so we've been doing a multi-pronged approach here to look at solving the problem of phishing. And so we've been doing, uh, we can roughly divide our work into two parts, the human side of things and the computational side of things. On the human side of the things, I'll be talking a little bit about the interviews and surveys we've been doing to understand why is it that people fall for these scams and what do they think is being secure? What do they think, uh, how do they understand these attacks? Uh, the next two parts, Fish Guru and Anti-Fishing Phil, these are different training mechanisms we developed. Can we effectively train people in a way that's not boring and is also very useful in practice so they don't fall for these kinds of scams? Uh, then the next part in the human side will be understanding the effectiveness of browser warnings. Can we actually build browser, better browser warnings to protect people? On the computational side of things, we've developed a machine learning algorithm. It's called Pilfer, and it's actually an email filter that can try to detect a lot of these kinds of phishing attacks and remove them from your inbox before you ever see them. We've also developed uh, information retrieval and search engine algorithms, uh, called, one's called Cantina, which will use uh, existing search engines to try to find a lot of these fake phishing sites, and then again try to make it so that people don't see them at all. And then uh, if we have time at the end, I'll talk a little bit about some of our ongoing work with machine learning of blacklists. So our, our philosophy here is we should try to automate where possible. So try to eliminate the threat so people don't even see the threat. It doesn't even enter their inbox or the web browser at first. But we also know that this is not gonna be a 100% approach. No machine learning algorithm is gonna ever be 100% effective. So we also argue that we need to supplement people's skills so that they can better detect them. So we need better training and better user interfaces to help people make better decisions. Now, yes? Is there a reason why no machine learning algorithm will ever be 100% effective? Is there a reason why no machine learning algorithm will ever be 100% effective? Uh, I don't know if there's a theoretical reason, but we've yet to see one that is even close to being 100% effective. Uh, our best result so far is 0.04% false positives, which we think might be good enough in practice, but we're still not quite sure what is a good enough reason. It also turns out that one of the reasons that uh, industry is a little bit reluctant to rely on machine learning algorithms is because they don't want to be sued. So if, for example, you falsely flag my site as a phishing site, I would get really angry and it would also expose those companies to being, uh, to being liable for that. So that's another reason why uh, in our algorithms we've actually been trying to focus on the lower false positive rates and not, as, and not so much on the false negative rates. Okay, so I'd also like to uh, give you a feel for the impact of our work as well too. So our game teaching people about phishing has been played over 100,000 times and featured in over 20 media articles. Our study on browser warnings has actually helped influence the design of Microsoft Internet Explorer 8. This will be the next version of Internet Explorer 8. Our filter is actually live and is labeling several million emails per day. Uh, we've also done evaluations of anti-phishing toolbars, and so this has been cited by several companies and presented to the anti-phishing working group several times. Anti-phishing working group is the largest organization. Uh, it's comprised of banks and other corporations who are trying to combat the phishing attacks and these online scams. Uh, our Fish Guru, this is the embedded training system, which I'll talk more about later, has undergone field trials at three companies. There's actually a variant that is in use by a large scale email service provider today, and it's also been used in the APWG's takedown page, which is once a fake site has been identified, we, the APWG encourages people to redirect them to their site, which also teaches people not to fall for scams again in the future. We also have an article in the December issue of Scientific American, so if you want to see the short version of this, a highlight of this, you can look at this article. And as James mentioned, we've also founded a company to try to 
uh, commercialized a lot of these technologies. So in my talk, I won't be focusing on the commercial aspects of this. I'll be only talking about the stuff that's already been published, the public information. Okay, so first I'll start with the human side of things, uh, which is the interviews and surveys to understand decision making. What do users know about phishing and why do they fall for it in the first place? So what we did in the study is we actually interviewed 40 different internet users. We've tried to get people who are novices. We asked them a few sample questions like, have you fixed someone else's computer? Have you ever created a web page? And so on to classify between novices and not novices. We asked people to do a mental models interview. So we asked them to role play. Your, your name is Bobby Smith. And we want you to go to this email as if this was your actual inbox. And you are part of a company named Cognix Inc. And we had them answer a lot of open-ended questions. Now, here's two papers that you can read for more information, but I'm just going to give you the quick overview of what our results were. So there's very little information and very little knowledge in general of what phishing meant. So a very typical comment was something to do with the band fish, I take it. So this is sort of a, a very, again, very prototypical comments, uh, but only about half of the people had ever even heard of the term before. Only about half of our participants said that they had ever noticed an unusual looking or suspicious looking URL. Okay, and most of them did not consider URLs to be suspicious at all. Now, again, you know, a lot of you in this audience were chuckling at this, but I think that the risk here is that there are very few signals on any given web page that tells you whether something is legitimate or not, and the URL is one of the most uh, strongest signals that you can use there. But if people don't realize that this is something that's important, then you know, they're not going to be likely to be able to identify the fish. About half our participants reported being cautious when email asked for sensitive financial information. Okay, so this is good. People realize that I should not be giving out my bank account number. However, very few people reported that they thought that passwords were sensitive information. Okay, so this is a bad one because people don't realize that passwords can be used to break in your accounts. Uh, we also discovered something that uh, is, I guess will not be a surprise to any of the educators here, but a lot of the people we interviewed had very fragile knowledge about these scams. So people were very good and adept at identifying financial scams. But a few emails later, there was an Amazon email scam inside of there that asked people to log into the Amazon account. And almost everybody who did not fall for the, uh, the bank one fell for this one. So they did not realize that Amazon was also subject to these kinds of attacks as well, too. People also had very naive strategies for trying to identify fish. So the most frequent strategies that people did were not very useful in identifying the fish. So the three strategies we saw were this email looks like it's for me. It has my name. It has my email address. It's normal to hear from companies you do business with, and also reputable companies will send emails. So a very common quote that we got that exemplifies this is, I will probably give them the information that they asked for, and I would assume that I had already given them that information at some point, so I will feel comfortable giving it to them again. So the quick summary here is that people are generally not very good at identifying scams that they haven't seen specifically before, and people do not have very good default strategies to try to protect themselves. Yes. I have a question on your previous slide. You had mentioned that uh, a lot of people say this email appears to be for me. Mm -hmm. Did they give any information as far as like how did they determine whether it appeared to be for them or not for them? Okay, so the question is did, how did people determine whether an email was for them or not? Uh, so roughly it has their email address and it says uh, hello Jason or hello your name and that's roughly how it was. And sometimes, uh, and again, the criminals are very, very clever. So sometimes they'll put fake information. So they might say your credit card number is starting with 4128. And it turns out that almost all Citibank cards start with the numbers 4128. So they give information that seems legitimate, but turns out it's not. And just as a follow up to that one, did you find out if people fell for ones where somebody's email address, username was like Hello Kitty? And if it said Hello Kitty in the email, did they fall for that as well? Or? Oh, we don't have that specific information. Now, again, this is a case where the criminals do have this information, but they have not deemed worthy, us worthy to share it with. Yes, James. Um, does anyone do a content categorization of phishing attacks over a number of years to see how the style is changing? or? You know, for example, you guys published your first paper there in 2005. Might, you know, that have led to an increase in attacks on things like Amazon and non-bank accounts to get the data uh, to then use for bank accounts? Do, do people so, track it? So roughly, has there been a change in the strategies that fishers are using? Yeah, they, they've been using an amazing number of strategies they, at the email level, at the distributed systems level, and so on. Uh, I've been making some comments to uh, some of the people here that if you're interested in computer security and distributed systems, you might actually study what these criminals are doing because imagine you have a very strong adversary who's trying to shut down your website. What do you do to keep it up? And that's effectively what they're trying to do too. Uh, so, but th there are a lot of these strategies. I think that's a little bit beyond the scope and the amount of time that we have, so let me defer that to later. 
Okay, so let me talk to the next part, which is uh, fish guru and anti-phishing fill, which is can we train people not to fall for phishing scams? Okay? And sort of the conventional wisdom in computer security is we can't train people. They're not going to be effective. They're not eager to learn. They have no motivation to do this. So a lot of what, we're going, what I'm going to be talking about actually goes counter to a lot of the conventional wisdom in computer security. So one of the observations we had here is that a lot of the existing training materials out there, they are boring. I mean, it's just reading a web page, and a lot of it is ignored. So this is sort of our, our hypothesis going in. So our question is, can we train people during their normal use of email to avoid phishing attacks? So the idea here is periodically the good guys, us, or your sysadmins, we might periodically send you a fake phishing email. If you fall for the fake phishing email, we would show you an intervention so you wouldn't fall for it again. And then the intervention is sort of the question, how should you design this intervention so that's effective? So here's an example. Here's our eBay example. And if you clicked on our fake email, we would show you an intervention, for example, that might look like this. And so this is actually the result of many iterations on design where we're trying to show a compact and concise form of information about what's going on, how to protect yourself, what the criminals are doing, and more, uh, more information for people. We've also been applying a lot of learning science principles, too. So these are experts in, a, uh, these are principles elucidated by experts to try to explain what are better ways of trying to teach people about these kinds of things. So this includes things like learning by doing. So it's not just reading, but it's also doing something, getting immediate feedback after you did something, and then the conceptual and procedural knowledge. The conceptual knowledge is understanding that phishing attacks exist, and procedural knowledge might be, here's how you can actually take steps to protect yourself in the future. So we've actually done a large number of studies on Fish Guru, and uh, the question here is, is embedded training effective? And I think so far we can say the answer is yes. I'm going to only talk about the first two of these studies where we've done lab studies between participants. We've also had a field study and a field evaluation at a large company, and they tested 300 employees. And we also have an ongoing study at Carnegie Mellon with over 500 uh, participants, too. So again, I'm going to just give you highlights of the first two studies. So uh, the first question we're trying to answer is, what's an effective design for these interventions? So you can imagine a very ineffective design is, boy, are you stupid, you fell for this again. And you can imagine that people are not going to be very eager to learn after you say something like this. So in our first intervention, we actually created a diagram that tries to explain very logically what's going on here. So over in the top left, it tells you why are you seeing this message. Over in the top right, it explains what's a phishing scam. On the bottom left, it explains how to identify a phishing scam. So it gives you some hints. It tells you things like it has a professional and legitimate looking design. It gives you a sense of urgency. It tells you there's an account status threat that gonna, they're going to shut down your account if you don't do something. And it also tells you that the links don't match with the status bar when the mouse is moved over. So we're trying to give people actionable items that they can do to protect themselves too. And th this turns out to be something that's important later on because if you don't have these actionable items, it turns out you just make people more paranoid, which turns out to have bad results in terms of the studies. And also it affects in teaching people. And on the bottom right, again, it teaches you some more things, simple things you can do to protect yourself. Now, in our second intervention, we created a comic strip. So this is trying to tell a story as to what's going on. In the top part of this comic strip, we actually tell a story about the scammer, what the scammer is trying to do, how it's easy to forge an email, and how it's easy to send out these fake emails. And then on the bottom part, it tells what happens when the receiver, when the, the end user receives one of these emails and what they can do to protect themselves. Okay, so what's our results? So in our first evaluation, we actually divided people into three different conditions. The first condition is standard uh, email protection, the standard messages you get from PayPal and eBay to try to protect you. The second one, group B, is the diagram that explains the phishing, and group C is our comic strip that tells a story. Again, we screened people so we only have novices. We, uh, we had a protocol where we had people go through 19 emails, there's four phishing attacks scattered throughout, and also two training emails. Again, we asked people to role play as Bobby Smith inside of Cognix. Okay, so our results. So uh, here is the first phishing email that almost everybody fell for it. So this is before any kind of training, so it looks like everybody's falling for these kinds of attacks. They're very susceptible to it. Oops. In the second one, this is the first training uh, incident. So you can see that group A, again, is the standard PayPal and standard eBay notification. So you see only half of the people clicked on it, whereas everybody clicked on our training messages. So that means everybody actually saw our training messages. They fell for it, and then they, they uh, actually saw these and were trained to some extent. Now, the interesting part actually comes over here at the very end, which is how many people fall for these phishing scams after they've been trained. And you can actually see there's a slight difference uh, inside of these. So the first one, fish number 14, this is the one where almost nobody fell for it. This turned out to be a very easy kind of bank scam not to fall for. So you can see that the incident uh, of people falling for it is quite low. 
But if you look at number 16, you'll see that people in the standard security notices, actually a lot of the people still fell for it. So this is online card member services about updating some information on your credit card. And you'll see that almost everybody in the standard control condition fell for it, but very few people fell for it in our training conditions. And the interesting, most interesting one is actually the last one, which is uh, you notice that almost everybody in the control case fell for it. Uh, this was a, uh, I think this was another credit, no, this is a PayPal one. So asking people to update their account on PayPal. A lot of people fell for that. People in our diagram case still fell for it, but you'll notice that in group C, very few people actually fell for that. So what does this mean? So I think we can clearly say the existing practices of security notices is not very effective. You'll see that, again, there's almost no difference in people not falling for these phishing scams later on. The diagram intervention did work somewhat better, uh, though you'll notice, again, that some people did fall for the fish. Our comic strip intervention did actually work the best. If you run the statistics, it's actually statistically significant, too. So uh, we think it's a combination of having less text having graphics and having a story that actually made things a lot better here and motivated people to actually learn better. So uh, we actually still had some more questions here. So in our second evaluation, we looked at this. Do you have to fall for phishing email for it to be effective? This is actually an interesting question that when we talked to some of these companies, they were asking us because they were saying, we don't want to fish our customers. So it, are, can we just send them the intervention instead? Can we just send them your comic strip and they'll be, uh, they'll be taught? And then, how well do people retain the knowledge? Do we have to train them? How well do they remember it after a week? And uh, hopefully even longer. Do they remember it after a month or even after several months? So we had roughly the same experimental protocols before. Role play as Bobby Smith. This time it's 16 emails. We had four different conditions. The embedded condition means you have to fall for our email so that you see our training. The non-embedded one means we just send you the training message. Suspicion means that we sent out uh, a fake email from a friend saying, I've heard about these phishing scams. You might want to be careful about it. So we want to try to differentiate between being suspicious and getting some kind of training. And our control case means that no, they got nothing at all. And we also had people come back a week later to see how effective things were. So here we also revamped our education too. So here is our intervention. So you can see it's a little bit uh, better in the graphic design. And so uh, here, let's try the wisdom of crowds approach. Do you think that you have to fall, how many people here think you have to fall for phishing attacks for it to be effective? Okay, so raise your hands. So maybe about two dozen people. How many people think that we can just send the comic strips and then it will be effective? Okay, one person. And how many people here are just for, here for the free food? Okay, a lot of people, all right. Uh, that's what I was afraid of. That's always the worst sign. Okay, so it turns out that yes, you actually do have to fall for the phishing email for it to be effective. So the bottom three cases are the um, non-embedded case, the control case, and the suspicion case. You notice that it's almost exactly the same all the way throughout. This was before, this is before they got the training. This is after they got you know, some training if they weren't in the control case. And this was after a week. And you'll notice that there's almost no effect there. Okay, so it turns out that just sending a comic strip is not effective at all. But you notice that there's a huge learning effect after you fall for one of these scams. So it turns out that there is a, a teachable moment after you fall for one of these scams that will prime people to be ready to learn. Okay, so this is actually a pretty good uh, result here for us. And how well do people retain their knowledge after a week? It's actually quite good. You notice that after a week that there's still people are pretty good at identifying phishing scams. So we think to some extent this is a pretty positive result. Okay, so some more discussion here. It's, so again, the act of falling for fish is a teachable moment. Fish Guru can teach people to identify fish better. People are retaining the knowledge well. And it turns out, and this is another positive result, that people are not resentful about this. That they, a lot of people that we've been talking to at our ongoing Carnegie Mellon study are very happy to get these kinds of messages. So 68 out of 85 people surveyed said that they recommend CMU continue doing this sort of training in the future. And a prototypical quote here is, I really like the idea of sending CMU students fake phishing emails and then saying to them essentially, hey, you could have gotten scammed. You should be more careful, and here's how. Okay? Yes. Yes, Daniel. So, did you show them or did you describe anything besides the URL that could almost definitely uh, determine that a link is probably uh, questionable? That's the first question. And the second one is, what in the other methods can the fishers uh, adapt so oh, that right. you know, this training will only be useful for about three weeks? OK, so we, ha we have a two-part question. The first one is, what specifically are we trying to teach people? And the second part is, well, how will the criminals adapt? So uh, for the first part of the question, uh, we were teaching them simple strategies like, don't click on these links, type uh, the address into the browser or use a search engine. Uh, make sure, uh, be careful about emails that ask for too much information, sensitive information. 
and things like that. We've actually been going through a lot of debate internally within our group as to what specifically we should be teaching people. But so far, we think that the ones that we're teaching people are quite effective. Now, the second part of your question is the more complex ones, which is how will the criminals adapt? And this is actually an interesting part that differentiates usable privacy and security from basic HCI, which is that in HCI, you're basically tend to be struggling against a bad user interface. But here, in privacy and security, you're at, sometimes you are facing an active and very smart and very deep-pocketed uh, criminal or adversary who can do a lot of things against you. Uh, we, we actually have not come up with a good solution as to what happens if they try to spoof our site, what happens if they try to you know, do other kinds of things, uh, and how they, they can try to adapt. I think in the short term, in the medium term, our stuff will still apply, but it's not quite clear how things will uh, pan out in the long term. Okay. So this is definitely a question uh, I think that we could go through a lot more discussion, but in the interest of time, I think we'll also hold off on this, that discussion. So uh, here's an example of the APWG landing page. This is the one that we helped the anti-phishing working group develop so that if you click on a website that's been taken down, you'll be taken to a site that looks like this. And again, you'll notice that there's a lot of the training that we've included inside of here to teach people not to fall for these scams again in the future. This also turns out to be a very useful data source for us, so we're analyzing the data right now. And if you are also interested in telling your family about this too, uh, fishguru.org is the website that we've set up that is our public site that you can get more information about to teach your family and friends not to fall for these phishing scams. Okay, so that's the embedded training part. The next part I wanna talk about is a game that we developed called Anti-Phishing Phil. And the basic idea here is can we teach people about not just email, but also about the web browser. And so we wanna teach people about URLs, how to identify URLs inside the web browser, and how to identify good and bad ones. Okay, so if you're interested in trying out the game, you can also try it out. And so here's the basic idea behind it. You are Phil, you're that little fish over there, and you are inside of this bay, and there's a lot of worms here. And your goal is to eat the good worms and to avoid the bad worms. Okay, so if you mouse over each of these worms, then each of them has a URL associated with it. So given this URL, which is HTTP 202.57.something, do you want to eat it or reject it? Reject, all right, good, all right, you didn't fall for that. So it'll say, gotcha, and then the dad comes out saying, good job spotting numbers in the URL. So again, you'll notice it has all the, the stuff from the learning sciences I described before. We have the characters, we have immediate feedback, and you get, to, you get to apply your learning almost immediately. So the stuff we teach you, and then you get to try it out immediately afterwards. Uh, then here's another one, and this is also a fake one. If Phil happens to take the bait, then he gets fished up, and he gets taken to a, a worse place. And then Dad again comes out with more advice. Don't trust your URLs with all numbers in the front. Okay? And then we also give feedback again at the end of each round, where it tells you what you got right and what you got wrong, and again, how to avoid these problems in the future. Okay? And we also have a lot of these in-between screens, which tells you, for example, where do you look for these URLs inside of uh, the web browser? So is Phil effective? So let me tell you two different studies that we've been doing. The first one is a lab study with 56 people. Our study protocol was uh, evaluate 10 websites, label them as fish or not. So people knew that this was a security study as, as opposed to the other one. They, didn't, they thought it was just an email study. In this one, we tell them we, there are gonna be some scams, so we want you to identify them as scams or not. Then for 15 minutes, there are four conditions. People could either read printed materials on training, so this was the best material we could find online. Uh, they could read printed copies of Phil's tutorial, so they could read printed copies of this. So we want to differentiate between playing the game and just reading the tutorial information. Or they could just uh, check email or play solitaire. So that was a control condition. And then afterwards, they uh, label 10 more websites. So how effective are things? So it turns out that uh, there's no statistical significant difference in the false negatives. So in a control condition, you notice that people don't do very well at all. But if you look at the other conditions, before and after, people actually are learning quite a bit in all different conditions. So this means that in terms of false negatives, that you are calling, uh, so the false negative here is you call a fish a legitimate site. Okay, so that's bad. So it turns out that you can see that people are improving their ability to detect these kinds of phishing sites, but they're roughly the same in terms of their capabilities. Okay? So that means Phil is just as good as reading the training materials. Now where it gets interesting is if you look at false positives. Okay? So you'll notice that existing training materials that people increase false positives. So false positives here means that I think a legitimate say, site is fake. I think the Citibank site that I'm on is a fake site. Okay? Now this is actually not as bad as the false negative, but it's still bad because it means you think all sites are bad. It just means that you become more paranoid. Okay? So this is the problem with existing training materials is that again it just makes people more paranoid. But if you look at anti-phishing fill, we have the best results here, and they are statistically significant, which is that we actually significantly decrease people's numbers of false positives. Okay, so this means that we are not just making people more paranoid, we're giving them better tools so they can differentiate between the good and the bad. 
Okay? Now, in our next study, we've actually had 4,000 participants in a field trial of over 80,000 people. Uh, in our control condition, we had them label 12 sites and then play the game. So you just wanted to see how good people were. In our game condition, we had them label six sites, play the game, label six more, and then a week, later, uh, a week later, label six more after that. So for a total of 18. So we wanted to see what the differences were before and after playing the game and how well they retained the knowledge. Okay? And so you'll see that uh, in this condition, 2,000 people were in the game condition. So what are the results? We divided people up into novices, intermediates, and experts based on their pretest condition. So if you got zero, one, or two correct in the pretest out of six, we put you in the novice category. And you'll notice that there's a huge improvement in the novices overall in terms of the false negatives. So again, the false negative is you think a fish is legitimate. So this, this is a really bad case. So you can see that there's improvement over there, but there's not so much improvement in the intermediates and the experts over there, the two bars on the bottom. However, if you look at the false positive rate, you'll notice again that people do dramatically better here, which is everybody actually does much better here, uh, that they are much better at uh, being able to correctly identify legitimate sites as legitimate afterwards. Okay? So again, we're not just making people paranoid. Okay, so for false negatives, Phil is at least as effective as his existing training, but it's a lot more fun, and it's a lot better in terms of false positive rates. So again, we don't want people to delete all emails from Citibank. We just want them to delete the fake ones. So the terminology I've been using here is we want to sharpen people's spidey sense so they can tell the difference between the good and the bad here. Okay, so that's the, uh, the training part. Now let me talk about some of the work we've been doing in browser warnings too. And the question here is do people see understand and believe browser warnings. And I think that this one is actually a really interesting one for probably all the people here who are dealing with any kind of user interface because the question here is, how do you actually send notifications and warnings to people that are effective? And so that's sort of more, the more generalized question here. So let me tell you a story about the, uh, the existing version of Internet Explorer. So the current existing version has two different kinds of warning. It has a passive warning, which when you go to a web page will pop up and tells you this might be a phishing website. Phishing websites impersonate trustworthy websites for the purpose of blah, blah, blah. And then it, it sort of tells you that you, know, you can report whether this is a web phishing website or not. So this is something where it's using heuristics and it thinks that something might be bad. Okay. Internet Explorer also has an active block where this is a reported phishing website and also will prevent you from going to this page. Click here to close this web page. Continue to this web page, not recommended. So there's two options over there. And then we also compare this to Mozilla Firefox. They have an active block over there. You'll notice it pops out over there, suspected web forgery. This web page has been reported as a forgery, blah, blah, blah. Get me out of here, ignore this warning. Okay? So we compared these three warnings against each other. And we also compared it against a control case where they had nothing. Okay? We set up a shopping study. Here we told people that, again, we did not tell them this is a security study. We said that this is for shopping, and uh, we set up a, our own fake websites, and we had them added to the uh, Mozilla Firefox blacklist and to the Microsoft blacklist. And uh, we asked people to purchase things both on Amazon and eBay. We gave them about $30 and said that we want you to purchase these different kinds of things. And we, uh, we, at the time, because we know when they purchase something, we could actually send a fake phishing email at the right time. So immediately after someone purchased something from eBay, we knew to send uh, a fake phishing email to them at that point in time. Okay? And right after they, uh, they bought something from the Amazon site, we could do the same thing. We, they were also using their real email accounts and their personal information. So we're trying to make this as realistic a study as possible to give people as much motivation to protect their information for real, too. Okay? So what are our results? Okay, so the first result here is that almost everybody clicked on our fake emails, even people with PhDs in computer science. Okay, so if you are thinking that I would not fall for this stuff, you would be wrong. Okay, so this is sort of how we can show that uh, effectively designed phishing attacks can work quite well. Okay, so the next interesting thing over here is that you'll notice that the passive Internet Explorer warning and the control case are roughly the same, that they are very ineffective in trying to protect people. So almost everybody who is in these two conditions fell for our fish. The interesting case over here is Firefox versus the active block in Internet Explorer. You notice that in Firefox, everybody clicked on it, but nobody fell for the phishing attack. Whereas in the active block in Internet Explorer, uh, almost everybody uh, clicked on it, but only half the people fell for it. So you notice that here it's showing that Internet Explorer Active Block is not as good as Mozilla Firefox. Now the question here, of course, is why is this the case? Now if we look at this, um, the passive Internet Explorer warning failed for many reasons. One is that it does not interrupt the main task, which is people are clicking on this thing and they're trying to log in. Okay? It's also slow to appear. Sometimes it takes up to five seconds for it to appear. It's not clear what the right action is. So if, if you look at this, it doesn't tell you what you should do. Should you close the web browser? 
Should you report this? Should you look at the email again? It tells you nothing about what you should do. Uh, it looks too much like other ignorable warnings, so this is a habituation problem. And finally, there's a bug in implementation where any keystroke will actually dismiss this. So it turns out that if you're on this page, and if it takes five seconds for it to appear, you're probably already started typing in your username, and in which case, any of those keystrokes will have dismissed this window. So that was actually a bug in the implementation. The more interesting case here is the Active Internet Explorer warning. A lot of people saw the warning, but it turns out they did not believe the warning. Okay, so here's a quote. Since it gave me the option of still proceeding to the website, I figured it couldn't be that bad. Okay? Uh, and there's also some element of habituation. It turns out that this warning looks a lot like the 404 not found warning. And so a lot of people just thought that this was a 404 not found warning. And in fact, we saw pathological cases where one person, two people, they clicked on the email, they saw this warning, they closed the web browser, went back to the email, clicked on it again, saw the web browser and closed it again, and went through this cycle several times before they gave up. And I've been arguing with a graduate student. He says this is good because they could not get to the site. I argue this is bad because they didn't know what was going on. And so this is actually this is a big problem. And so you can imagine that this is you know, something that's quite important, not just for security warnings, but for other kinds of warnings. How often do all the people here in this audience actually just dismiss those warnings? You know, I admit I'm guilty of that too. So this is actually a really interesting question, which is how do you design better warnings? So uh, the good news, of course, is that the student who was working on this, he actually did an internship at Microsoft uh, for the summer, and, he will act, and his designs have actually been incorporated into the next version of Internet Explorer 8. So this means that the browser warnings will be much better when the next version of Internet Explorer is deployed. Uh, we've also been looking at something called a science of warnings. So the question here is, do people see the warnings, understand it, believe it, and are they motivated to follow through with these warnings? So it turns out that there's actually a, a large number of uh, research that's been going on in physical signs, so labels like these chemical warnings or road signs or whatnot, and we've been trying to adapt that for these computer warnings to understand how we can create better warning systems overall. Uh, so better design and better systems that deploy these warnings for people. Okay, so that was the human side of things. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit and talk about the computational side of things. The first thing I'll talk about is can we automatically detect these phishing emails? Okay. So the question here is uh, can we create an email filter that detects these phishing emails? Lots of stuff, in, lots of work in spam filters, but how good are they for phishing? So what we did here is we actually combined a whole bunch of these heuristics and put them inside of a random forest algorithm and we actually evaluated how well this actually works. So here, I'm not going to talk too much about the specifics. I'll point you to this paper. But here's the basic uh, results of uh, our system called Pilfer. It turns out that we can do much, much better using basic machine learning algorithms and heuristics if we combine some basic spam assassin features than if we just compare it to existing spam, uh, spam removal filtering systems. So you see that we have far fewer false positives by orders of magnitude, by two orders of magnitude, and we do decently better in the false negatives. So it turns out that we are actually doing a larger scale field trial on a newer version of the system, and we're doing this uh, on several million emails right now. So we will be getting the results, and I'll be able to tell you more exciting numbers later on. Okay, the next thing, uh, again, this is a whirlwind overview, but I'll talk a little bit about fish detection of websites. Now, uh, like I was saying before, industry uses a lot of these blacklists to try to label these phishing websites, but the problem with that is that they are slow to react. They can take several hours or even several days before they're added to these blacklists, and that's a window of opportunity for the criminals. So can we create better heuristics that can automatically detect these phishing websites? And it turns out we actually use a very simple algorithm. We actually just use a, a version of, we just use a variant of the Google search engine. You know, actually, we use the Google search engine itself, and we just type in certain kinds of keywords in there to try to find whether a website is legitimate or not. And so the basic idea is, given a website, create a fingerprint of the website, and then put it into the search engine, and with high probability, if it's legitimate, it should appear in the top results. Okay? And so the idea here was actually developed by some researchers at Berkeley a while back ago. The idea was called robust hyperlinks, which is to solve the 404 not found problem. So their idea was, again, if we add a lexical signature to the end of each URL, if it turns out that URL doesn't exist anymore, you can put the lexical signature into a search engine, again, with high probability, find the original web page. And how do you generate the signature? It turns out that the most common information retrieval algorithm is used, TFIDF. So the intuition behind TFIDF is, uh, it stands for term frequency, inverse document frequency. Term frequency means you want to find words that are really common on your page. Inverse document frequency means you want to find words that are really rare on the internet in general. So an example for eBay might be the words eBay and auction would be really common on eBay's web pages, but rare on any other random web page out there. Okay? And their surprising result was five words are sufficient for this to work in most cases. 
So a concrete example here, here's our fake website. If you apply the TFIDF, your five words are eBay, user, sign, help, forgot. If you go to the real site, you get the exact same words. Okay? Now, if you look at Google, you throw those five words inside of there, and it turns out that this result right here turns out to be the exact legitimate site that we were looking at, and the fake site is nowhere to be found anywhere in the top 100 or 1,000 results. And again, this is due to the fact that PageRank, very few people point to the fake phishing sites, and the other reason is because phishing sites uh, turnaround time or their time to live is actually quite short, so on the order of a few days. So that means it's also less likely to be crawled by these search engines. So for these two reasons, it actually works quite well in practice. So how, how good are the numbers? Yes? Could you also then just look at the page rank of the site and somehow determine from that if it's phishing? Yes, yeah, so that's another possibility too, though uh, we've also have seen some phishing sites that do have high page rank. And it turns out the reason for that is because sometimes people hack into existing websites and use the existing site's page rank to do that. So that's why page rank is a good approximation, but it's not the full story there. OK, so uh, the results are actually quite good. Uh, we had a basic implementation, and we got about 97% true positives and about 6% false positive. 6% is actually uh, quite high and would be higher than we would want inside something that we deploy for industry, but it's still pretty good. We used a lot more heuristics to try to knock down the false positives. If you want more details on that, I can tell you more about that. But in the interest of time, I'll try to cut that short. But uh, we can reduce the true positive rate, but also significantly reduce the true positive rate, uh, the false positive rate as well, too. OK, uh, this is the next to last slide. So uh, let me tell you a little bit about our ongoing work in anti-phishing, too. So we've also been looking at machine learning of blacklists. And the basic question here is, if all these blacklists exist, they sort of are human labeled data. So are, is there anything that we can do with this? And it turns out the answer that we've been finding out is yes, we can actually get surprisingly good results if we look at the URLs and the content of these phishing sites. So the idea is once any one of these phishing sites enters one of these blacklists, can we eliminate that entire class of phishing attacks completely? And the reason we think this works well is because this, the criminals, they're smart, but they're also lazy too. It turns out they use toolkits to generate a lot of these phishing sites, so the content is actually quite similar in a lot of cases. So uh, using our early results, we've gotten 87% true positive rates. And again, here we don't really care so much about the true positive rate, but we care about having a very, very low false positive rate because we want uh, the industry to adopt this technology and we remember that they are very reluctant to adopt things with very high false positive rates because they don't want to get sued. So it turns out that we have 0.04% false positive rates, which is far better than any other heuristic we've seen out there. So we're pretty happy with this result. Now, the other part we've been looking at is the social web plus machine learning approach. Can we harness the power of all the users on the internet to try to help us find these phishing sites and combine it with machine learning algorithms? So it turns out that Fish Tank is a community site where people can submit these kinds of sites. Uh, they think that something is phishing and then it requires five total votes to say that something is a phishing attack. Now, uh, there's several problems with this approach. One is that there's still a long time to live. It takes about 12 hours on, in, in, on average for them to shut down or to identify one of these phishing sites. And so the question here is, can we use machine learning algorithms to try to augment people's votes? And so this is a very preliminary work. We don't have any strong results yet, but currently we're collecting the data using Mechanical Turk to try to see how effective are people's votes. Does it turn out that maybe two votes plus machine learning vote turns out to be good enough? In which case, we can actually uh, have much better results and do it much faster as well, too. OK, so here's the last slide. Uh, this is uh, giving you a whirlwind tour of a lot of the work that we were doing in usable pricing and security, and specifically in phishing. I think I, I hope I've convinced you that usable pricing and security is one of these grand challenges for the future, because this can really uh, in, inhibit the adoption of a lot of these technologies. We've seen a lot of the benefits of information and communication technologies, but now we're starting to see a lot of these systems be used against us. And so how can we try to reap all the benefits of these while minimizing a lot of the negative consequences? And I think that this is actually a quite important area of work to help make sure that, again, we can reap all the benefits and also minimize these consequences. Uh, and also a whirlwind tour of a lot of our work in anti-phishing. The main thing I want you to get out of this is that we've been looking a lot at the human side of the things as well as the computational side of things. And we need really the whole 360 degrees of protection to protect people from a lot of these online scams. Uh, and we have a lot more information and references to these papers at cups.cs.cmu.edu. Uh, and finally, I would like to thank a lot of people on the left side are all of my collaborators and uh, the postdocs. The right side are all of the different students that have been helping us throughout the various years. And we have uh, also many thanks for all of our research sponsors, the NSF, Army Research Office, Scilab, and Portugal Telecom. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions. Yeah, Sunny?
So I had a couple of questions. The, the first was about the, um, the fish guru and the anti-fishing fill. It seems like the studies were mostly done in task-based kind of environments, either in the lab or in the field. So I was wondering if you had a sense for if people have the time to deal with that when they encounter it as part of their daily routine, like if they're at work and they get interrupted in the uh, middle of email. OK. So Sunny is asking about the interruption cost of uh, doing this additional kind of training. So part of the uh, embedded training approach where we send the fake emails, it was designed that way because people may not necessarily know that they need to be trained, so that we thought that it would be a better way to bring the training to them. Now, there is definitely a cost as to being interrupted and falling for these scams and so on. Uh, so it's sort of a, a question of how often should we train people and what are the costs of not training them and so on. That's sort of an analysis that we have not really done yet. But it, it actually is a very good question to ask, um, especially the how often do people need to be trained. For anti-phishing fill, it's actually one where people directly go to the game and they choose to be trained. And it turns out that if you look at the amount of time that people spend playing the game versus reading the training materials, people actually did spend more time playing the game because they thought it was a lot more fun and they learned a lot more out of it. So whether that's a problem or not, it really depends on what your perspective is. People could be trained using anti-phishing fill, the game, in about 15 minutes or less. So we still feel that that's a pretty reasonable trade-off in terms of the amount of protection that you would get afterwards. Uh, you have a follow-up? It was about, you said the Carnegie Mellon students like the idea of Carnegie Mellon trying to train them on anti-phishing and that's like an educational environment. Do you have any sense for if an employer, if employees would want their employer doing that and how right, would they right. feel about their employer monitoring them? That so way? in the one company we've tried it out so far, the response was positive that they did enjoy this, they did like it, and uh, we had only positive comments. We have not heard any negative comments about the training. So we think that this is actually quite positive because there was another study that was done at a different university where it was slightly different and they got lots of negative response about it and they got lots of angry uh, emails to the researchers saying these researchers should be fired. We've got nothing like that, only positive stuff. <laughs> uh, yes, in the back. Yes. Um, uh, so, phishing seems like an, a, a sort of an easier target than, say, getting my permissions right on my files or, you know, managing my data, which is where I actually do want some people legitimately be able to use something, whereas phishing is sort of one of these there is a correct strategy, which is like sort of almost ignore everything that seems remotely suspicious, and that's fine, where that's not going to work in a whole bunch of other areas. I'm curious where you think you're going to take this uh, to, you know, more towards the grand challenge rather than fishing. So what I would say here is that fishing is one, so the question here is, is fishing really a grand challenge, if I could really summarize it. And uh, I would say that it is, it is one where we're seeing lots of increasing incidents about it. And I would say that it's actually, like I was saying, it's costing several billions of dollars. So I would say that anything costs over a billion dollars is probably at least some kind of challenge. Uh, so I, I hope we can agree on that kind of metric. <laughs> so, uh, but I, I think the question you're really trying to ask here is, are there more generalizable results we can take from this work and apply to other areas of usable price and security? I think uh, some of the things I was hinting at, like the science of warnings definitely is, what are effective ways of training people too? So sort of our philosophy that we've, we're finding over the years is, we need a combination of better user interfaces, better training, and better filtering, and better automated responses to try to protect people. And what is the right way of balancing all of those things, too? So in the file permissions case, what is the right combination of automation versus the training versus user interface? And so this is sort of a fundamental question in all of the usable privacy and security, because you can imagine that the wrong level of automation could abstract too many things away, or it can make the task too hard. So that's, I would also say that's another generalizable result here, or more like a general question that we can extract from this. Um, as for the other areas of usable privacy and security, we are looking at, for example, file permissions. That was one of our students' PhD dissertations. He's now uh, doing, uh, a, I guess, a pre-sabbatical over at Microsoft to try to help improve their file system work, but he will also be starting at Penn State University soon. So his name's Rob Reeder. We've also been looking at better privacy policy permissions, too. So for these Ubicomp systems, how do you make it so people can craft more effective privacy policies that they feel comfortable with and are willing to share with other people? So they feel that they are in control of these systems rather than you know, just uh, outright sharing a lot of information. So a lot of the ideas we've been uh, having inside of this have been having, helping us with the synergy on the other projects that we've been doing too. So it's sort of like there's a question of the direct line of research and sort of the peripheral effects. And so in our direct line of research, I hope you can see, yeah, the, the several billions of dollars, we hope we can blunt that part. But there's also some of the science aspects and the trickle down effects to other areas of our research and hopefully other people's research too. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you.